what uh, I wanted to just give you an update. We have um, about 950 registrants uh, for the conference right now uh, from over 100 countries. Um, that's not to intimidate you, Dr. Young, but just to let you know that there is an incredible audience you have before you. Um, we've had some interesting questions coming from um, the folks around the globe, and these I encourage you all to continue to post your questions on the chat room, and um, Dr. Young will be able to answer as many as possible directly after her presentation, and hopefully will uh, also answer them uh, afterwards in the chat room. So without any further delay, let me introduce Dr. Young to you. She's a colleague and a good friend and a professor of pediatrics, uh, immunology, and medical science at the University of Toronto. And she is also a senior scientist in cell biology research <clears throat> and the scientific director of the Hospital for Sick Children's Biobank and also the Hakming and Deborah Chu Chair in Translational Pediatric Research at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, the goal of uh, Dr. Yang's research is to understand the mechanisms governing autoimmunity, specifically the mechanisms involved in initiating and sustaining the immune response in childhood arthritis and rheumatic diseases. Um, basic science findings have been translated into clinical correlates, which in turn are leading to new therapeutic interventions to improve the outcomes in affected children. Dr. Young is leading both national and international efforts to understand the biologic basis for heterogeneity in childhood arthritis and rheumatic diseases towards what we're developing or what she and her group and many around the world are doing in terms of personalized treatment decisions. Um, she is supported by an incredible number of uh, uh, different foundations and federal grants uh, and international grants, and uh, she is extremely well published. I urge you to go to PubMed and uh, type in her name. So without any further ado, uh, to, I will uh, allow Dr. Young to give her presentation, uh, which is entitled Towards Precision Medicine, data-driven machine learning approaches towards understanding autoimmunity. Thank you. Um, good day, good afternoon, good morning to all of you, and thank you very much to the organizing committee and to uh, Dr. Eleanor Fish for this uh, kind invitation to join this really exciting international effort and, uh, and learning uh, uh, and, and, and conference. I'm thrilled to be able to uh, share some of the lessons that we've learned um, in um, um, precision medicine. Uh, using some childhood um, uh, uh, rheumatic diseases as our um, uh, as our template for learning. So um, I'm just going to launch right into it. And if there's any technical difficulties, I will uh, ask you to please uh, 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 text with um, with Stefan, uh, and I will try to address them. Um, I am sharing my screen, so I just to let the uh, organizers know I do not I will not be able to see the chat until I actually come to the end of my presentation. So again, just uh, um, uh, 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 in terms of the uh, uh, requisite disclosures, I just want to disclose the um, peer-reviewed funding as well as some of the commercial funding that supports some of the work that we're um, uh, going to talk about in the next 30 minutes and um, some key references um, that uh, follow uh, and will support some of the data that I will show. I'm happy to provide all of this uh, as uh, resource materials afterwards. Um, in terms of the learning objectives for the next 30 minutes, really like to um, review uh, from the bedside uh, some of the lessons that we've learned from the kids with Kawasaki disease and childhood arthritis. Now, follow that up with some of the really kind of neat artificial intelligence approaches that we have towards pattern recognition, using these diseases as our learning templates, and then to describe some of the challenges of how we actually translate what we learn at the bedside and um, integrate that with some of the biologic data um, that the new era of um, genomic medicine provides us. And then lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about how um, using machine learning and, uh, and math really is uh, helping us to understand these areas. So really precision medicine is a goal that many of us in medicine, in science are aiming for right now. 
And precision medicine, in order to enable it, requires significant amount of um, uh, infrastructure and resources. And that's what you see on the left-hand side from really a lot of the studies that you're hearing about basic mechanisms to really collecting the patients and populations to better understand them, to also making sure that we have harmonized standard operating procedures so that everything that we're comparing is really apples to apples and not apples to oranges and providing the infrastructure, both in terms of the computational ability, the repositories of clinical data, as well as biologic data, and making sure that we think towards the future so that we're collecting these, um, not just for today, but the benefit of generations in the future. These really lead to the ability for us to generate data. And this is what we hear about all the time, all the layers of genomic data, whether it be at the exposure level, uh, called the exposome, whether it's signs and symptoms, whether it's really the genomic data, the epigenomic data, the microbiome data, and all these omic data that we're talking about needs to be integrated. And it's a little too much for the human mind. So all these millions of data points require the new skills in artificial intelligence and computational biology for us to synthesize the data to give us patterns that can lead to new therapeutic approaches new diagnostic approaches and new ability to classify these and hopefully impact the way that decision makers in our various countries, in our various uh, jurisdiction will be able to give us access to medications and the pathways we need to treat and better improve care in children with these children and adults with these diseases. I'd like to provide an example from some of the lessons that we've learned from a disease called Kawasaki disease. And Kawasaki disease is um, really shown in this picture here. It's a, a, a disease that affects young children, usually under the age of five. And they prevent with um, really the classic signs uh, that immunologists like to call um, inflammation. So redness, um, fever, heat, and swelling. And you can see that these kids have prolonged fever. They have a rash, which can look like anything. They have red eyes. They have red lips and tongues. They have swollen lymph, lymph glands, especially in the neck. And they have swollen hands and feet that are usually red also. Now, this disease doesn't just look like the red inflammation that happens, but the reason why we're very worried about it, it's now the number one cause of acquired heart disease in, all, in really the developed world. And the reason it is such is that Kawasaki disease actually affects blood vessels. It causes inflammation of the blood vessels. And one of the most important blood vessels in our body that it targets is the coronary artery. And this slide is basically a, a slide of an angiogram of a, of a heart of an affected child that has developed multiple aneurysms. You can see these big balloons here are giant aneurysms in a child that has been affected by Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease usually affects boys a little bit more than girls and a sex ratio of 1.5, 1.6 to 1. And as you can see, a little rarer in the very young babies and a little rarer after you pass toddlerhood. A whole range of organisms, infectious organisms, as well as other environmental triggers have been implicated as the cause of Kawasaki disease, including all of these viruses, as well as um, bacteria, and um, yeah, even coronavirus, you can see here, has been implicated as a cause of Kawasaki disease. Now, what's common in these, as opposed to what's common, uh, uh, what's the difference between them, is that all of these are danger signals in the, in the view of the immune system. All of them have a commonality of being able to trigger a, an immune response, which is actually partially, at least, mediated by the antigen presenting cells or the danger sensing cells that have a mechanism inside that actually recognizes danger signals um, as part of the immune system. And this danger signal system uh, really um, uh, is, uh, is, a, found, uh, is a, 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 a lays on top of the uh, inflammasomes. So in particular, inflammasomes are really these um, uh, uh, that help regulate immune homeostasis and they produce IL-1 beta and IL-18 as really the signature cytokines. And there's usually a very, very um, uh, uh, intricate and wonderful balance that our body has to keep ourselves from having ongoing inflammation, um, uh, but also the ability to be able to dampen and recognize these pathogens and um, uh, 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 ramp up the immune system and then ramp it back down. When we looked in children with Kawasaki disease, 
what's actually um, fascinating is we actually found markedly elevated levels of the signature cytokines that are found with inflammasome activation, in particular IL-1 beta, its natural antagonist, IL-1 IL receptor antagonist, IL-18, as well as its natural antagonist, IL-18 binding protein. And you can see these are the kids with acute Kawasaki disease that came in before treatment. They have very, very high levels of both the ligand as well as the receptor, the ligand as well as the receptor. And after their disease, during the convalescent phase, these come back down very nicely. And interestingly, not only do they come down when we look at kids that have fever but do not have Kawasaki disease, they are much lower than the kids that actually have Kawasaki disease. What we do know is not only do these danger signals, these external environmental triggers um, trigger this inflammasome reaction, there are multiple genetic factors that are very important in actually um, uh, really determining how a child responds and develops Kawasaki disease. And we know looking around the world that the um, incidence is very, very different with the highest incidence in the um, Orient, especially in Japan and Korea, with the lowest incidence in Denmark and New Zealand. And this is really stable. We see it in all continents of the world, but um, uh, very different um, in ethnicity. And when children of Japanese descent move to other countries, they maintain their higher incidence. Genetic studies in Kawasaki disease have really found a whole slew of very important genes in um, uh, inflammation that have been implicated in the disease. And in particular, there is one gene called that I'm going to focus in on just as an example, uh, really a case demonstration called ITPKC or inositol 145 triphosphate 3 kinase, ITPKC. ITPKC, in a nutshell, just regulates how calcium works inside the body in terms of the one of the very the many things um, regulate calcium, but ITPKC is one of these very important regulators of intracellular calcium metabolism phosphor, um, regulates the phosphorylation of IP3 to IP4. And if there's more IP3, IP3 binds to the IP3 receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum, causing lots and lots of calcium release. The bottom line is calcium release is very important for many, many things in our body, and in particular, inflammasome activation. So when we asked this, um, we needed to ask functional and mechanistic questions using an animal model of this particular disease. And this animal model actually really resembles Kawasaki disease in that these little animals, when we give them an extract that causes Kawasaki disease, develops inflammation around their coronary arteries. And by um, not only do they develop inflammation, they develop the breakdown of their elastin in their vessel wall which is the hallmark of aneurysm formation. And when you look in these animals, either wild type normal animals versus animals that are missing this important gene that was found in Kawasaki disease, ITPKC, you can see that the um, cells, especially the monocytes in this particular case from wild type mice, have a much lower baseline level of calcium. So starting without doing anything to these cells, these cells in the absence of ITPKC already have a higher intracellular calcium level. And when you tickle them and stimulate them, they have a much higher level and they stay that way. And interestingly, when you look at the um, cells, not only do they have a slightly, um, uh, uh, this uh, in the absence of ITPKC, you can see that the NLRP3 inflammasome, in fact, is much higher in these cells. So that when you actually look at baseline, um, without any stimulation, and you're looking at these cells, they have actually higher um, protein levels of, I, uh, of NLRP3. When they're developing the disease, they have higher levels. And when we're giving them a typical stimulus for this inflammasome, which is LPS and ATP, they have higher levels. So again, when these mice are developing Kawasaki disease in the absence of ITPKC, they make more IL-1 beta. And when we tickle their cells, they make more IL-1 beta. And interestingly, when we give the mice without ITPKC, this important gene, the disease, they actually have a much higher incidence of the disease and a much higher disease severity in the absence of this particular gene. Now you're gonna ask, um, the most important thing though is not only is it that we see it in mice, but that what about the children that are affected with this disease? So we took 
um, important bio samples uh, from children that had Kawasaki disease, and we asked the exact same questions. We took these cells, uh, these EBV transformed cells from children with Kawasaki disease, and we knew that the genotype that actually gave us a risk genotype in this particular gene, ITPKC, let's just call it the CC genotype here. When you actually look at these cells, this is the baseline, again, looking at calcium level here. At baseline, the kids that are at risk for Kawasaki disease actually have a higher intracellular um, level of calcium compared to the other genotypes. And when we tell them with, again, the same stimulus that we did with the knockout mice, they had a much higher intracellular calcium flux, again, looking at this. And this is sustained over and over and over compared to the wild type. You can see that over 10 minutes, there's still increased intracellular calcium flux. And interestingly, in these children with the risk genotype of ITPKC, the less ITPKC they are, and just look at the protein, the more NLRP3 there is. So again, the same scenario that we're seeing in the knockout mice. And in the children developing Kawasaki disease, those with the risk genotype have much higher levels of IL-1 beta and IL-18 during their disease. But more importantly, we can see that those with the risk genotype actually have a much higher incidence of failure of treatment. So it really does predict treatment response to whereas they 65% of these kids do not respond to treatment only 20 to 25% of kids that do not have the risk genotype or are heterozygous actually uh, do. So in summary, what we think is happening is the kids that have a genetic change in this protein, in this gene actually leads to decreased amounts of protein. Decreased amounts of this ITPKC protein lead to actually a change in the ability of IP3 to convert to IP4 leading to really uh, many downstream effects, the most important of which is increased intracellular calcium, which leads to upregulation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, leading to production of IL-1 beta and IL-18. So you can say, well, Ray, you looked for IL-1 um, beta and IL-18, so it led you down this pathway and you looked this pathway. How about if you didn't look that way and you did it completely hypothesis-free? And there are multiple ways that we can do this. And one way is by basically just letting patterns come up, um, uh, 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 asking the computer to find patterns in our patients. And that's exactly what we did. So one method that I'm gonna describe very, very briefly is called um, uh, uh, similarity network fusion. And it basically takes multiple, multiple areas and basically has the computer pick out patterns in each layer of information as what we showed in our uh, previous slide and be able to have each one of the layers teach each other. So what Anna Goldenberg did here was she um, constructed a new software or machine learning algorithm that plots similarity matrices. So you're plotting each patient, comparing them to themselves. So patient one, two, three, four, five along here, the same patients along here. So along the diagonal, they will always be 100% similar because it's the own patient against each other. But the machine algorithm is able to pick out patients that are actually very, very similar to each other and construct a similarity matrix. And if you do this for every layer of information that you have, you can see that the, on this layer, top layer, these three patients are very similar, but they're not on the bottom layer. Whereas on the bottom layer, these three patients are very similar, but not on the top here. And by teaching the machine, by through machine learning and artificial intelligence, these two layers talk to each other and teach each other. And after thousands and thousands of iteration, it says, hey, these patients are actually very similar. These are similar and these are similar. So they're able to really resolve differences between patients using this method. So we applied this SNF to Kawasaki disease. And we fused not only clinical data, but gene expression data and other biologic data. And we were able to find three clusters. And you can see there's a unique gene expression profile when, these, when we do this. So that cluster one looks a little bit like cluster three. Cluster three is kind of the pale version of cluster one, less intense. And cluster two is dichotomously opposite. And when we actually do pathway analysis and see what are these genes that are so different between the clusters, 
immediately all, an IL-1 beta signature pops up. It's actually innate immunity, that's the difference. And when we look at them, there's actually one group that is actually very, very responsive to IVIG or the treatment that we use in this disease. But these groups actually differ in terms of their IVIG responsiveness and their coronary outcome. And the fascinating thing is that it actually points in a, a completely hypothesis free, this is just data driven way, that it is actually IL-1 beta. That's an important signature that determines the differences between the various different cells, uh, the, the various different uh, patient groups that we're looking at. So what, what can we learn about IL-1 beta? What can, we can learn is that IL-1 beta is not unique to Kawasaki disease. In fact, it's new. We never thought of IL-1 beta as important in Kawasaki disease before. But it's very important in a known group of diseases in children that have arthritis in particular, a type of arthritis called systemic arthritis or systemic JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. They share fever as a feature. They have arthritis as a very prominent feature. They have the swollen lymph nodes, the, the, the red eyes, the rash, all of those are common features. And what's really fascinating is that in the children that I care for with Kawasaki disease, we found quite a number that actually had um, Kawasaki disease when they started out, and then they evolved into systemic JIA. They had classic aneurysms, classic Kawasaki disease, and then turned into a systemic JIA. So what can we learn about this? What we can learn is that the typical child with Kawasaki disease has the fever, has the rash, has the conjunctivitis, and then it kind of stops and they peel. This is actually very, very classic in Kawasaki disease. Their skin peels. But in the kids that evolve into systemic JIA, their arthritis becomes very, very, very prominent. And arthritis we only see in about 10% of kids with Kawasaki disease. And this can be persistent as well as the systemic features of fever and rash. And we see now, and we care for now, about 28 children out of 2,300 that we've had with Kawasaki disease develop this systemic JIA. Now systemic JIA is one of these diseases which is a horrible disease. This is a young lady whom we looked after in our clinic who actually passed away from her systemic JIA. And it's one of the, one of the diseases that can um, lead to really total body inflammation. And not only has a horrible burden on the individual, but has a horrible burden also on the caregivers in the family, as well as on society, because the costs are tremendous. What we've learned is that early intervention can actually change the biology meaning that if we treat these children early, we can actually prevent many of the horrible complications that we see. But it is a rare disease and it's a heterogeneous disease. So although systemic JIA only makes up about 7% of our population, they are the children who are the sickest in our, in our group, but there's a whole bunch of other children that are not as sick that are really difficult to tease apart because the children who are very, very sick should be identified so that we can treat them with the strongest medications, but the strong, with strong medications come strong side effects, and we don't want to give the, this un, unintended side effects to children that do not need those medications. So we took the same approach that, we, um, that I shared earlier, that we took these multiple layers of information, signs and symptoms at the bedside, genomic information, much like how we use a GPS. Many of us use this to drive, to tell us to turn left, to turn right, where the computer algorithms actually integrate all of these layers of information to give you directions. We're basically hoping to do the same with patient information so that instead of telling us to turn left or turn right, it's gonna tell us, should we use steroids? Should we use an anti-TNF agent? Should we use other drugs? And that's what um, uh, we're aiming to do. So much like what we talked about earlier, we took all of this clinical information, millions of data points, and you, we use multiple different mechanisms to boil down that information, and that's called dimensionality reduction, and come up with hypothesis-free but data-driven models. And I'm just going to go through and uh, share a little bit of information about a proof-of-concept experiment that we did on children with, uh, with arthritis, juvenile arthritis. We took these children and multiple layers of information and I had the computer basically tell us, what are we looking at? And I apologize for this busy slide, but I'm gonna break it down because we did what we called principal components analysis as our pro approach to dimensionality reduction.
And the first principal component, and these again are just composite regulators instead of composite descriptors. So instead of taking millions of data points, the computer has now distilled these and said, listen, the first and most important descriptor of the differences in your patients can be, can be um, uh, distilled down to this group of very important um, variables. And interestingly, all these variables are pro-inflammatory cytokines. The second variable that the computer picked out for us was measures of disease activity. And again, the computer did this, not the human. So these are internationally known and recognized um, uh, 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 measures of disease activity in children with arthritis. And the third variable that the computer picked out was really the time to diagnosis, the number of joints that are affected, and whether it was a TH2 or a TH17 phenotype. And lastly, it was a more granular look again at the immune response. So it really drives home the point that it's the immune response, the immune response, the immune response, which seems to be a very important foundational thing in, um, uh, in childhood arthritis. And when we use these four variables, we can find and cluster um, our patients and we can find five distinct groups of patients. And without going into any um, uh, detail, we can find that the ability of these clusters, these biologically based clusters have an enhanced ability to look at differences. This is really titrating a p-value threshold. And as we all know, p-values, anything greater than uh, less than 0 0.05 is pretty significant. 0 0.05 is here. And using all the variables, you can see it's pretty darn all the way down to 10 to the minus 17. We have the ability to distinguish between patients using biology. And why is this important? And this is a kind of just a, a and it, this figure is not meant to uh, confuse, uh, but really meant to illustrate at a very, very high level what we're seeing on the left hand side are the new clusters and what we're seeing on the right hand side are the old clusters. But I want to bring your attention to two very important clusters. Remember what we talked about is the first variable, the first outer band here is principal component one, which is a measure of inflammatory cytokines, and principal component number two is a measure of disease activity. And you can see in these children, they have variable, this group, they have a varying inflammation because red is very, very high and blue is low, but they have exceedingly high disease activity. Alternatively, there's another group of children here that have incredibly high pro-inflammatory cytokines, but clinicians at the bedside are not finding disease activity. In fact, it's low, it's blue here. So these kids have clinically inactive disease, but they have subclinical inflammation. So how did they do? When you actually look at these kids, the kids that actually in the first group, whom had a really high disease activity at the bedside, but varying inflammation, they did really well. So six months later, we gave them the right medication and they did really well. But for these kids that had subclinical disease, so they had nothing that we could find at the bedside, but inside their body, they had tons of inflammation. They didn't do so well. And this really points to the fact that we really need to be able to understand the biology that's inside our bodies and not just what we can see on the outside. So the bottom line is we did the same thing. We found five clusters. We used the similarity network fusion that I showed you earlier for um, uh, uh, Kawasaki disease. And similarity network fusion also came up with five clusters for JIA. And very, very interestingly, when you plot these clusters, and again, these are individual patients and these are the genes, you can see that there are five unique clusters, one of which has unbelievably high gene expression and cytokine expression. And when we did the SNF on it and found these five clusters, what's really interesting is in one of the clusters, there we had this very, very high um, uh, uh, expression of the cytokines and uh, gene expressions. And when we actually look across all of these clusters, there is only one SNP that is highly expressed in this particular cluster, really pointing to the fact that biology is a very, very important component of driving disease, driving our understanding and the ability to be able to make meaningful decisions to treat patients and to be able to um, uh, help us personalize the therapy for children. So really in summary, I'd like to, I, I hope I've, uh, I've uh, demonstrated some of the lessons that we've learned from Kawasaki disease and arthritis.
that biologically based patient clusters can be identified and that by using the computer and artificial intelligence to enhance our ability, our mind's ability to look for patterns, we can resolve differences. <clears throat> and these biologically based predict, um, groups can predict disease and that we can actually um, uh, direct our therapy uh, in a more logical, rational way by being able to resolve differences in these children. So our conclusion is that there's multiple really neat ways now using artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us identify children um, and, uh, and patients and treat them better. And that by including biology in our analysis of patient groups, it provides not only clues to what's happening in pathobiology, but the most important thing is a rationale to better guide our therapy. And that right now, it's a really exciting time to not only be in science, but it, to be in medicine, because it gives us an opportunity to bring all of the learnings and all of the explosion and growth in genomics and, um, uh, and computer uh, computational biology together to be able to improve care for our kids. So really, in summary, I'd like to say that um, reviewed a little bit about some of the um, infrastructure that we need in order to support precision medicine, some of the genomic data that we can actually fuse using normal, nor, norm, um, novel approaches in computational biology, which leads to hopefully these new approaches in treating disease. And it's really by hoping to um, uh, improving this that we can change therapy. So I wanna close uh, with one of our ch uh, childhood ambassadors. And this uh, is a young man who has a severe type of disease, um, uh, systemic JIA that I shared. And this was before um, the use of a biologic agent identified, um, uh, before IL-1 blockade. And IL-1, we, we now know, is the cause or one of the very important cytokines that are responsible for systemic arthritis. And this is him out of his wheelchair and onto a motorcycle after we started IL-1 blockade. So in closing, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators uh, and uh, really uh, it's a family uh, and team effort in all of this, we have a group of international uh, collaborators, both uh, in Canada, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Sweden, as well as Australia, who participate in this, as well as the United States, um, the members of our Canadian team, some members of our Canadian team at one of our launch meetings, some members of our Dutch team, uh, when they received funding uh, uh, to uh, join together to do this work, and okay. members of my lab, and in particular, um, uh, Simon, who is one of my PhD students who did uh, this work, and a computational biologist, uh, uh, Quaid Morris and Anna Goldenberg, uh, who really, uh, without their um, really brilliant mathematical minds, would not be able to do these uh, computational, computational algorithms. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd very much be uh, delighted to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ray. So there are indeed a number of questions. Um, so. First question is uh, related to the early uh, part of your talk. Are there other ways to regulate intracellular calcium that might infect the inflammasome? And following on from that, the question was whether uh, differences in calcium flux that you see is all from increased influx or if there are differences in um, endoplasmic reticulum calcium efflux to the cytosol. So it's a great question. Thanks so much for asking it. Um, so the first, uh, first, in answer to the first question, there are lots and lots and lots of um, uh, calcium intracellular uh, regulators of intracellular calcium uh, mobilization, some at the plasma membrane level, and as you correctly noted, some at the ER level. In fact, for ITPKC, the regulation is at the ER level. So it's really at the ER um, uh, mobilizing endoplasmic reticulum um, um, uh, 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 calcium um, uh, into the intracellular uh, space. There are other um, other genes that we're looking at. In fact, if you actually go back to the Kawasaki disease GWAS, the first, um, um, uh, if you actually group it according to calcium mobilization, the top 116 genes are all related to cal intracellular calcium mobilization, some at the plasma membrane and some at other multiple other organelles within the, uh, uh, within the uh, cell. So um, we're in the process of studying many of them. Um, and um, interestingly, um, genetic polymorphism, the, the very significantly between Caucasian populations and Japanese populations. So that for some of them, especially one called um, SLC, um, uh, uh, NX, uh, 
uh, NCX1. Uh, it's a sodium um, uh, calcium regulator at the cell membrane. Um, the risk allele is much more frequent in Japanese than in uh, uh, in uh, Caucasians. So um, it links that um, uh, it links uh, the the genetic predisposition to really the pathobiology of the disease. Um, thank you for asking that question. Okay, there there are loads of questions. So I'm just going to quickly ask another couple sure. more. So the principal component analysis um, was very well received. And the question is, do individuals in the low disease score cluster begin to present disease symptoms later in life? So moving them to a different cluster based on age at uh, when the analysis was done or is done? So, yeah, so it's a fantastic question. So just to, uh, I know I went through that a bit quickly, so I apologize, but all of these children were actually um, uh, placed into this categorization at time of diagnosis. So again, um, we know age actually figures uh, into the disease significantly. It was in fact one of the classifiers that we have. So um, it was not a cross-sectional study. It was a prospective um, inception cohort of new onset disease. So all of these patients were diagnosed at time of um, uh, and classified at time of diagnosis. So a great question because I think age is one of the factors the um, uh, the time and the uh, stage uh, uh, in terms of developmental biology really does lead to this. When we do principal components analysis later on, it's confounded by treatment. So the treatment um, per se will con uh, uh, confounds the uh, uh, the ability um, uh, to uh, uh, well uh, uh, for classification. But even when we look at these uh, patterns, especially when we include joint patterns into it, these patterns are stable across time. So we've looked uh, across five years and the children actually stay within their cluster mm -hmm. despite the confounder of treatment. So there's a treatment resistant group and a non-treatment resistant group. And no matter what you kind of hit it with, um, the children in the treatment resistant group remain with that biologic signature. We can dampen it with certain treatments, but again, their biologic signatures remain stable, which is uh, also um, really a, a humbling thing a humbling uh, a lesson because we've been treating the, uh, these diseases now with different um, uh, therapeutic agents. So another question that was asked, um, uh, it was somewhat unclear what uh, uh, tissues you sampled, whether it was blood, um, joint, uh, synovium fluid, and would that have an impact on the analysis and what do you consider to be the best tissue to sample in the clinic to predict JIA disease progression? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'd love to be able to have synovial fluid on everybody, but it's difficult. Um, and uh, and we all know from uh, from uh, 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 looking after organ-specific autoimmunity that the signature that you find in the blood is just amplified usually in your target tissue, and whatever is your pathogenic population seems to be a little bit more. So um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the 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 tissue that we sampled, it's blood. We feel that blood is the most accessible bile specimen. Uh, and from a um, going back to clinic to make it a really a clinically applicable test that everybody can do, um, it would have to be blood. So everything that I showed uh, was from peripheral blood. And again, it's whole blood. Uh, nothing has been sorted, uh, and it's uh, um, and these signatures have been found on whole blood. So another question was: Does it mean that kids with Kawasaki disease uh, need uh, not to be on calcium-rich diets? And what's the consequence uh, of you limiting in the amount of access to calcium? Um, so great question. But again, it doesn't have to do with extracellular calcium. It has to do with intracellular calcium mobilization. So as long as you have the mechanism and our body has our bodies have so many checks and balances in place to take care of all of the abuses that we put on our body, whether it's a calcium rich diet or a sodium rich diet, we have lots and lots of calcium. Uh, we have lots and lots of uh, mechanisms uh, to regulate that, but it's really a genetic, it's a combination of a um, factor that activates your immune system and then the intracellular calcium mobilization. So um, uh, no worries about a calcium rich diet at all. Okay, uh, another question was, is there any danger in blocking IL-1 beta in terms of exposure to infections and impact on other pathways and uh, health and wellness? Fantastic question. Um, we routinely now use anti-IL-1 blockade in uh, both um, Ka uh, Kawasaki disease as well as in systemic JIA. And as we know, most of the uh, um, uh, biologic agents that we use in the clinic uh, 
have an increased risk of infection. But the risk profile of blocking IL-1 beta is actually lower than blocking TNF, and in fact is much lower than blocking using steroids for immunosuppression. So it's quite safe. In these children, uh, about, uh, at least in Kawasaki disease, a third of them have a co-infection co uh, co co uh, at the time because that's the infectious trigger that triggered the immune response, which we call Kawasaki disease. And in these kids, obviously, they need to be treated for their infection. But the anti-IL-1, and especially the um, uh, resistant kids, we don't use it for everybody. We only use it for the kids that have recalcitrant disease. By the time their immune system has um, uh, really amplified to that stage, and especially in kids that have an exaggerated immune response that leads to something we call MAS or macrophage activation syndrome, the anti-IL-1 beta is actually life-saving in these kids. And in fact, far outweighs any of the infectious risk that can potentially uh, happen in these kids. So we've had a, it has a very good um, side effect profile. Um, nonetheless, infection is always a worry, but uh, lower than steroids and lower than um, anti-TNF uh, agents. Okay, so finally, perhaps the last question um, where I can bring together a number of questions. We heard earlier on uh, this morning how the, um, the influence of uh, the meta metabolism, the metabolome on the immune system. And the question here was, um, have you factored into your um, uh, machine learning strategies how the environment, how the impact of diet will influence um, disease development, uh, categorizing, and so on and so forth? A fantastic question. I think uh, um, everybody's very interested in the effect of not just uh, infectious uh, uh, effects, uh, but this uh, the environment, so uh, uh, the, the uh, exposome, as people call them now, uh, as well as the microbiome. Um, uh, as for part of our international studies, we've, uh, we are factoring these in. Uh, we are um, uh, uh, capturing some environmental exposures, uh, and, and some people are also capturing microbiome. Um, it's the really exciting thing in autoimmunity right now is to really try to understand what is the um, uh, contribution of all of these um, uh, body external um, uh, factors um, that are uh, uh, impacting our immune system. And it's a very, uh, very good question. Um, it's even more data <laughs> than we do when we look at genomics. And when we look at transcriptomics and when we look at um, proteomics, when you include um, uh, metabolomics into it, when you include um, uh, um, the microbiome, um, you're really um, uh, 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 needing these machine learning algorithms because we're talking about tens of millions of data points. So um, absolutely in the future, uh, critically important to integrate and critically important to the individuals as we go forward. But again, um, uh, not integrated as yet in this particular data set. I think we're in, its, we're in the infancy of understanding the exposome and microbiome, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it in the future. Thank you for asking such a forward-thinking question. Thank you very much. So on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you again for an outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. Delighted. Thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us on Saturday morning and for that wonderful talk. So next we're going to actually uh, bring forward